This morning I ask a question, who needs compassion? You know, Brother Jerry, we, we grew up Baptist and we voted on everything. You know, and uh, as we think about it, you know, who needs compassion? Well, every one of us, every single one of us. You know, and I'm here to present to you a gospel, a good news that Jesus understood the suffering associated with his life, the pressures and the, the difficulties of living life. And Isaiah, the prince of preachers, spoke and predicted of a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as he describes our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Despite the efforts of sin, there is hope. Despite the efforts of the devil, there is overwhelming evidence of hope. There is one coming who will who have the power to reverse the curse, to heal all diseases, to restore paradise as it once was created. The one promised by the Old Testament prophets to be the Messiah, the Savior, the King. The New Testament, especially the Gospels, makes it extraordinarily clear, at least for those with an open mind and heart, that there is one person that can accomplish those things. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. All others are charlatans, fakes, and frauds. And there are many. The New Testament was really written, really written, especially the Gospels, to establish that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That He's the Lord of the universe. That He's our Savior. The second person of the Godhead. And that He alone, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life was crucified, buried, and rose again, and demonstrated over and over again the absolute power over this natural world and the spiritual realms as well. The passage that we're about to read could really be divided into three very easy parts. Be so easy to divide it that way that you'd say, well, I'm not going to pay him for studying that. That's too obvious. And so I elaborated on it, and it became like rattlesnake. As you eat it, it gets bigger and bigger and more involved and more involved. And finally, Sunday came, and I, I've got to regurgitate it back. And I've got to let you know what I've been filled with all this week as we look at this little passage of Scripture. Jesus comes into this world and wants individuals to know that He's God. So what does He do to prove it? Well, He, he says it. But, you know talks cheap. So God the Father voices it and many individuals hear it but then there are those who weren't there to hear or to see or to understand. And so he had to demonstrate it. In that while we were yet sinners, Jesus demonstrated that he loved us by going to the cross in our behalf, in our place. He took the punishment that we deserved so that we could go free. He demonstrated that. And in the Gospels, we see something very, very unique in the person of Jesus Christ as he demonstrates that he is God in the flesh. Now, I was thinking, if you wanted to do that, how could you possibly do it? You, you could do it by, uh, let's just stop the world from turning, right? I mean, he created the world. He did that before, by the way. There was a time in which the whole world stopped so that God's plan and purpose would be carried out. If you don't believe that, you'll, you'll do it in science to understand that that, that we have to add a quarter of a day for, for, for each year and we make up for it and call it leap year. And the reason why we have to do that is to make things balanced out. Why wasn't it balanced? Because in the Old Testament it told us that God stopped the earth from turning for a given length of time so that so His will would be accomplished. I mean, he could do that again, couldn't He? Certainly He could. He could do some things that were just... I mean, what if he got up? He fed 5,000 people plus the women and children at one time with what? Two, I always get this confused. Two small fish and five loaves, or was it five, five fish and two loaves? You know the story, don't you? He did that. He could do that over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, I think Jesus could have done this. And see, if we vote on this one and say, you know what? Jesus could heal everybody at the same time with one voice. Say, healed, and everybody on the whole planet would be healed immediately. He had the power to do that. So you think, okay, why did he do the things that he did? I've got to believe, and I think I've convinced many of you to believe, that it wasn't haphazard. It wasn't just, well, what if, or it just happened to be that way, that it was planned. So why did he do the things that he did in the order that he did them to the people that he ran in contact with? Why? 
And that boils back to this one little thought, that we have a very personal God. He wants to have a personal relationship with his creation. He wants to have a personal relationship with you and to me. And it's not just a collective relationship. We're not just members of his family. That's not good enough for him. He wants to have a daily walk with you. He wants to speak to you personally. He wants you, and that's the reason why we say you need to accept the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. He didn't just die on a cross and now everybody's saved. He has a personal relationship with his creation. And in this passage of Scripture, you're going to see our, our Lord as he comes in contact with specific people at specific times to do outlandish things in their life. Read with me if you will. Luke chapter number 8, starting in verse number 40. Now when Jesus returned, he had gone over to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, remember? While he was on his way over there, a storm brewed. Matter of fact, it was a, I think it was a supernatural storm where the devil tried to drown him. And Jesus was totally at peace in his father's love and concern. And, and the disciples wake him up and said, Don't you care that we're going to perish? And Jesus got up and said, Shh. And everything went still. I mean, instantly, the storm was over, and they were on the other side. It was that morning that he met two men who were filled with demons, and one of them specifically deals with the Lord, and the Lord deals with him, and he cast out thousands of demons from that one man, and he was going to stay there and preach to her, and the people there said, No, leave us! And he gets back into the boat, and he goes back over to the other side where he's there at Capernaum, and there the crowd welcomed him. A contrast we see immediately here if you take this passage as a whole where there are those who receive him and those that reject him. How could you reject the Lord? Why would you reject the Lord? You know, it's sort of like the guy comes up to you and says, I'd like to pay your house off. And you say, oh, I don't want you to do that. I enjoy making those payments every month. <laughs> kind of silly, doesn't it? Yeah, I want to give you a new Maserati or a Lamborghini or a Ferrari and you say, oh, I couldn't have that. That would be just, just give me a Chevrolet. And you start dickering with the guy who's going to give you something. You know, this doesn't make sense, but you know, with those of us who have received and our eyes have been opened, it, it's foolish that they wouldn't accept. But to those who have not received, they look at us, the, those who have received, that we're the ones that are foolish. And here in this passage of Scripture, you see both. You see those who have rejected and those who have received. And the crowds there welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Don't turn the page, say right there, expect him. Just like right now. I'm waiting for the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I'm expecting him and I want him to come before I finish this message and you do too, don't you? Of course you do. You're expecting him. With this next breath, I'm wanting him to come. And they were there expecting him. Then a man named Jardus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl that was about 12, was dying. If you have children, you immediately relate. If you have young children, immediately, immediately you relate. Life is very fragile. If there's one thing that I've learned in my some odd years of existence is that it doesn't take much for life to be snuffed out. Fragile. It doesn't take a lot. Here, this man was facing not death for himself, but death for one of his most precious, precious possessions in this world, his daughter. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. Have you ever been football game at the end of the game and it seems like everybody enjoyed being there but when the game was over everyone wanted to leave at the same time. Now they're all going to the same general location, the parking lot, and they're all going to get there eventually but they all want to be there now. Jesus is there and the crowd is crushing him, pouring upon him. It was during that time that a woman was there who had been, subject, had a, had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. This word 12 shows up twice here. Interesting little idea on 12. Another message altogether. The significance of numbers in the Bible, but I'm not going to get there. But no one could heal her. Have you ever had of a disease that no one heals? They might treat it, but they don't heal it. 
It's ongoing. It's ever, 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 ever dealing with it. Listen to this. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his coat and immediately her bleeding stopped. Miraculous. At that moment, Jesus stops, turns and says, Who touched me? And when they all denied it, Peter says, I think he's lost his mind. Master, the people are crowding and they're pressing against you. In other words, how in the world would anybody know who touched you? But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Deliberate. Some force, not just a force, a particular force came out of him. And he knew it. And then, the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, I think she wanted to go unnoticed, the difficult thing, her, her disease that she had, the problem that she had, the stiflingness of, of the disease that we'll talk about, came trembling and fell at his feet. Now, I don't know if you do this in your Bible, but I do. I underline. Matter of fact, I have a special Bible that I use in the pulpit that doesn't have any markings in it whatsoever because the markings in the one that I use are all marked up that you can't read hardly. But here's a passage that needs to be marked, okay? Here it is. Came trembling and fell at his feet. That's a picture of every one of us who come to know the Lord. No one comes with the right heart anyway chewing bubble gum and blowing bubbles. Say, hey God, what's happening? That's not the way it happens. These, these people that say that when they get to heaven what they're going to do, I don't think most people know what they're going to do. I, mean, I don't think anybody knows what they're going to do. But I think one thing's going to be sure. We're going to be falling at his feet and being in fear and trembling of being in the presence of a holy and righteous God. In the presence of all of the people, she told why she had touched him. And how that she had been, oh, that little word, instantly healed. God doesn't do anything halfway. When God does it, it's full bore. Instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter. I want you to underline that because it's the only place in all the Bible where God specifically speaks affectionately here to a person and calls them daughter. Your faith has healed you. Not every single time is faith necessary for people to be healed. Sometimes God does it just because. I remember when Stephen was about three or four years old, and yeah, I have to pay him the five dollars now. But when Stephen was three or four years old, it was, Daddy, why this? Daddy, why that? I finally came to the conclusion that I know the answer to no questions that begin with the word why. And finally I came up with an answer that satisfied all, it didn't satisfy, satisfied me, because... Because I remember in a Bible class a thousand years ago, we were studying the tabernacle and the guy was talking about how come God used a certain size rope and how many times the tabernacle had to be pulled down to hold up the side. And finally, you know, they finally said, you know, it might just take that many ropes to hold up that curtain. It wasn't that every rope and every twine meant something. Because. And then look what Jesus tells her. She'd been doing a, talking to the idea of what happened and how it happened and, and, and why she did this. And he says, daughter, your faith healed you. Go in peace. And that's a significant point there because every person who comes to Jesus in faith believing goes away, how? In peace. Those that do not have the peace of God that passes all understanding have not come to Christ in faith believing. And every single one of you that know Jesus as your Savior, know that there's a peace that you can't explain as a result of coming to the Lord. Now those of us who try to explain it end up getting all twisted up here explaining that peace, but Jesus says peace. Go with you. And while Jesus was still talking to that woman, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. We'll tell you why it's significant in a minute. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Your worst fear has come to and now now what are you going to do? Hearing this, Jesus said to Jargus, don't be afraid. Just 
believe and she'll be healed. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible I don't understand. There's a lot of things that are perplexing to me and confusing to me. But I come back to this little verse that Jesus said to Jargus right there and I hang on to it. Don't be afraid. I've got it under control. I know what I'm doing. I'm the creator God. I know the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. I know how this... Don't be afraid. Here's your job. Just believe. Trust in the Lord. A little verse. We used to say this is my life verse. And When you ever wrote your name in somebody's Bible, you put this underneath you as your life verse. Do you have a life verse? Do you have a verse that kind of you pick out of the Bible that you follow and this is your... You know, you know other people might have it, but it's mine. I have one of those. I've quoted it a thousand times thousand. It's Proverbs chapter 3. And it says that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. All your heart. Don't have any reservation. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And allow Him to direct your path. Jesus said, don't be afraid. Just believe. Just believe. And she will be healed. When they arrived at the house of Jargus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, James, and John. First time that these three are identified apart from all the rest. Peter, James, and John, come in here with me with the child's father and mother. Do you know that there are times that you meet with the Lord that it's great that you have a whole bunch of people with you? Sunday morning, rejoice together and celebrate together and hear one another. But there are other times when you don't want anyone there with you. Just you and God. Jesus says, Peter, James, John, come on. Jargus, bring your wife. And they go into the house. Meanwhile, all the people were waiting and they were mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. Think about that for a minute. Let that one sink in. Here's the God of the universe that can do anything under the sun. I mean, there was a time in which the God of the universe breathed down fire from heaven and consumed several cities all at the same time. If you understood who it was that you were in front of, you wouldn't be laughing at him. They, in their minds, leaning on their own understanding, know that she was dead. And they see no hope. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Oh my. Simple. Shh. And the winds and waves stop. Child, get up. I don't know if you had kids getting them up to go to school or not, but it usually took a little bit more than, Child, get up. I learned from a very young, very young age with Simra and Stephen that if I went in and I sung to them, they got up immediately. The Lord gave to Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody Lord. And they mean man right out of the bed, you know, and they're ready to go. They certainly didn't want Dad to sing to them. Jesus walks in, child, it's time to get up. Her spirit returned, it says, at once. And she stood up. And then Jesus told them, give her something to eat. I mean, she's been sick to the point of death. She hasn't eaten in several days. Come on. She's hungry, showing that she's fully well and ready to eat. And her parents were, underline that little word, astonished because we're going to see it again and again and again. But he ordered them, and here's the perplexing part. Don't tell anyone what happened. Don't tell anyone what happened. So I'm thinking here this morning of this little outline that I put together. Jay, just follow. The first part that I want you to get a hold of is the fact that Jesus was accessible. Accessible. Have you ever tried to get in with somebody that was really busy? Maybe it's a doctor or lawyer, somebody of importance, and how much work it took to get in to see them, to get in to talk to them, to have an audience with them. Here it is, God in the flesh. And the part that I want you to see, first of all, is He was accessible. There were, there were people that could touch Him. There were people that could talk to Him. 
He didn't stay in Jerusalem in the ivory tower and give orders from on high, did he? He was out and about with the common, everyday folks. And his openness here and his willingness to talk to people and to deal with people shows that he was available. He was available. Not only was he accessible, people could get in to speak to him, but he was available to them. He, he could come and go and they could speak and he interacted with them. It wasn't merely accessible to the crowd, but he was available. And here's the interesting part to individuals. Jargis desperately sought Jesus. And when he got to Jesus, he fell down at his feet. Now there's a couple things different here. You remember there was a Gentile, he was a centurion, and he begged Jesus to come and to touch his daughter. There was another one that just said, say the word, and it'll be done. I think it's interesting, in both cases, Jesus did what they asked. Jesus, in this case, goes with the guy. And another time, when he's just say the word and it'll be done. And Jesus says, wow, what faith. And he says the word and it's healed at that moment. In this case, Jesus goes with him. With all of the demands of the crowd, you've got to remember how many of them are on there and they're pressing on him, they're pushing on him, they're relentlessly demanding of him. There is opposition. Matter of fact, Jargus was that said the, the head or the leader of the synagogue. He might have seen Jesus cast the demon out of that same synagogue there in Capernaum. He might have heard about Jesus raising the dead of that guy down there in Nain about 20 miles away. And walks in on a funeral service and he raises the guy from the dead who his mother was a widow. But you see the point is, is that Jesus was available for individuals and he spent time with people, and as you go through the Gospels, it is amazing the people that come to Jesus and He doesn't turn them aside, whether they are enemies or friends. There was one I remember, his name was Nicodemus, I call him Nick, and he comes to Jesus at night. Both of these guys had extremely busy schedules. I mean, Nick was a ruler of the synagogue and there in the high priest realm and was involved with all the worship that was going on in Jerusalem, and he's got a schedule that beats all of ours, and Jesus isn't some slouch that only meets on Tuesdays. I mean, he's got a bunch of things on, and the both of them finally get together and it says at night. And Nick asked him, we know that you're a teacher sent from God. We know that. And Jesus says, yep, God loves you so much that he sent me into this world to die so that if you would believe in me that you'd have everlasting life. Most of us have memorized John 3, 16. Jesus gave that to Nick. There was a rich guy who came to Jesus one time and he says, what must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what does the law say that you've got to do? And, and Jesus hears him repeat back immediately. He says, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love others as you love yourself. And Jesus says, you got it, go for it. And being cantankerous, he says, who is my neighbor that I'm supposed to love? And Jesus tells the story of the great Samar the, the, the good Samaritan. Ones that come to Jesus. There was a time when Jesus is going from Jericho to Jerusalem, or Jer Jerusalem to Jericho, and he says, I've got to go through Samaria. I have an appointment. He didn't say it that way. They didn't understand. They didn't want to go to Samaria. He says, I have an appointment in Samaria with a person. I've got to meet with him. And he gets to Samaria just at the right time when this woman is drawing water from the well. And he spends time with just that woman and really tells her more theological information than he did Nicodemus. He's going to the temple and there's a pool of water there called the Pool of Bethesda. And there's one that is crippled from birth. And he says, it seems that the spirit moves and I don't get to move quick enough. And Jesus, take your mat, take, right, take your bed, roll it up and, and walk. And he walks. The creator God walked with his people and he felt their pain and suffering. With all of the impressive miracles that he could have done to prove that he was God, what did Jesus do? He did those things which would relieve people's suffering. Instead of flying off the pinnacle of the temple like the devil wanted him to do, he rescued terrifying disciples from a life-threatening storm. Instead of creating food to eat for himself because he was hungry, 
he created food for thousands of hungry people. Instead of being lifted up on a mountain and casting it into the sea, he healed the sick and rose the dead. He chose miracles that touched people's lives. He is a compassionate God. I think when Jairus came to him, he saw immediately that his heart was breaking. His only little girl, 12 years old, is dying. The conditions are hopeless. He desperately needed Jesus. And immediately he forgot all about those people that were in the synagogue that were trying to kill Jesus or try to overthrow Jesus or trip Jesus at all. He knew that Jesus had the ability to heal his daughter. And he was going there for that purpose. And it didn't matter what other people were thinking or feeling or going to see. He goes in public and falls down at the feet of Jesus. If you understand this point, you'll do the same. For we are hopeless without him. Without him, we are lost and undone. And he alone can save. And he not only is accessible, he is available. And he wants us to come to him. I want you to take verse number 42, the latter part of that, and circle that and go down to verse 44. And I'm going to make up a word that goes along with this, okay? Just so make one up. It's, it's called interruptibility. Interruptibility. The ability to be interrupted. I don't know what kind of life you live, but I know that there are times when I really hate to answer the telephone. There are times when I hate the fact that, I, that I'm interrupted. I have an idea of what I ought to be doing. And God, please go along with my idea. And God doesn't go along with my idea. He has another idea. And you're interrupted. And a lot of times we're just agitated when somebody interrupts us. Especially if you're working on a problem. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't work well when somebody's looking over my shoulder and none of my fingers do what my mind tells them to do. And, and then I got somebody watching me do it and it's frustrating. And I'd rather not be interrupted. But I never see Jesus irritated by people interrupting him. As Jesus is endeavoring to go to Jargus, on his way, there's a crowd. I don't know about you, but going across the Enid is no big deal, except when you're in a hurry. And then every single light is red. You get behind that one person that they only get out on Tuesdays, between 2 to 3, and they never go over 20 miles an hour. And you get behind them. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and then when you're just about ready, run them off the road, a policeman comes up behind you, and he makes sure that you do what's right. Ugh. Irritated by the crowds. But you don't see Jesus irritated. As he's going through this crowd of people and they're pressing on him, he is speaking to them and talking to them and interacting with them, and then he feels the power go out of him. And you remember, the little girl is dying. There's got to be a timetable involved. Jargus says, you've got to come and you've got to come now. She is about to die. I need you to come now. And all this crowd is getting in the way. And then here comes this woman on the lowest end of the pole, totem pole here, on the, on the bottom end of the social ladder, she comes in, she is spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, everything, what I'd say, unclean. And she comes in and she stops Jesus right in his tracks. And you know what he does? He stops and deals with a woman. Compassionately, lovingly, patiently, takes care of a medical problem that only he could take care of and heals her. I think she's well on her way to eternal life as he calls her daughter. Your faith has done more than just make you physically well. And Jesus honors her with his time as he is available, accessible, and able to be interrupted in verse number 45 and 48, I thought of how that he never gets tired. Now, I know he does. I know he did. I know he gets tired. But it seems that he is inexhaustible. He has the ability to continue on like that energizer bunny rabbit. I mean, he heals people after people after people after people. And he's not content with restoring just this woman's physical life. But he, he says that she is socially well as, as well. As Jesus speaks to her and spends time 
In verse number 49 through 50, you see the faithfulness of our Lord. There's bad news that comes. The servant comes from Jargus' house and he says, you might as well go, go home. The funeral's well under its way. She's dead. Oh, by the way, don't tell him to come. No sense in having him come. The bad news hits. In Matthew's account of this, in chapter number 9, it says that at this point, Jargus says to Jesus, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Amazing faith. Amazing faith. In verse number 41 through 43, I got a different perspective. This one comes from the life of Jesus. You see, there's no hurry when you're the Lord of the universe. You've got it all planned out. You know what's going to happen. You know how it's going to turn out. Just another delay. That wasn't really a delay. That was sub point three of plan C. And after this significant delay, he goes to Jargus' house just in time for the mourners to arrive. I think they'd been told earlier she's about to die, to be ready. The paid mourners would be there wailing away. There'd be someone playing a flute in a, in a, in a minor key. It, it would be a sad time. There'd be people crying. And Jesus kicks them all out of the house and brings in Peter, James, and John, mom and dad, and then in verse 54 and 55, you see the power of our Savior to literally raise the dead. And this gentle, loving Savior personally dealing with one problem. Jargus' daughter is dead. And he says, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. Now sometime I want to spend some time with you on, on from this point forward, you know what the illusion... I'll put it a different way. From this point forward, the idea of physical death took on this illusion of sleeping. And some people even believed in what they call soul sleep. Her soul had separated from her body and she was dead. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. She doesn't come back to life and tell us all the things that she saw in heaven and how that she met with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and how that she just she didn't say anything like that. She's hungry. And Jesus says, give her something to eat. For death hold has been shattered and I'm going to give you undeniable proof that I have the ability to do anything in the universe. And he raises her from the dead. It closes this particular chapter with something very perplexing. Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Jesus has a priority here. Don't tell people about the miracle because I don't want to be known as a miracle worker. Don't tell people that about me raising people from the dead because I don't want to put the undertakers out of business. That's, that's not my job for being here. There's a priority in Christ's ministry. When it comes to telling people that I'm the Savior, tell the world. When it comes to people knowing that I am the Son of God, let everyone know. When it comes to the fact that I have the ability to save you from eternal punishment in hell, let everybody, let the heralders go forth. I want to be known as a savior. I don't want to be known. How opposite of today. We have the message of eternal hope. And we have a guy who comes through town who says he can heal. Who gets the most publicity? Would you want to be known as a person who could raise them from the dead physically or the person that could raise them from the dead spiritually? Jesus says there's a priority. Know me as Savior. As we look at this little passage of Scripture, I know it's involved. I know that there are two people involved that get healing and Jesus. I want you to see that our God reveals himself that he is a God that is accessible. He's not closed away, somewhere locked away, that cannot be interrupted, but rather he wants you to come to him. He's available. He has endless power, inexhaustible power, to do those things which are in the Father's will. He shows that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He has a perspective of heaven and eternity rather than here and now. He has the power. His name is Jesus. And his priority is to be your Savior. Let's pray.
before this Thanksgiving week,